a brief summary of Suzanne's uh, much more eloquent summary and notes. And then we'll go to some additional questions. There were some wonderful questions at, uh, that were left over from the sessions. And so we're going to need to do that. I think today uh, we had several lessons, some of which reiterated uh, the last session, but it's very nice to see reinforcement of these items. Individuals, what we can do is that part of the thing that we must do is to be intentional about developing the next generation of STEM leaders. Uh, Dr. Sunom Sumana pointed out that leadership training for underrepresented scientists targeted to them is incredibly valuable and that such training very much needs to be introduced into graduate level programs, particularly uh, uh, that don't just focus on academia, but but focus on leadership uh, writ large. Um, Dr. Husband's feeling, feeling husbands pointed out that, that passion, knowledge, courage, uh, listening with intention, collaboration, transparency, and principles are, are very important to keep in mind as we develop ourselves or continue our paths of leadership and our training of potential leaders. And President Linquist pointed out that what we do in higher education is the heart and soul of change that can occur. We've learned uh, from uh, Dr. Kaufman, uh, the value of applying the S curve to our own careers, to think through the course that we wish to take and to plot the individual steps as we go and to study how they work and what our next steps should be. And from uh, Yo-Yo Ma, we uh, got the wonderful concept of scouts and working at the margins, those uh, things that lead us to the edge of knowledge and bring back new knowledge to the crowded group at the center of the beach. Uh, again, Dr. Sumana pointed out that uh, there are some people who are more natural leaders than others. And of course, one of the great problems that we need to address is what aspects of leadership are, is one uh, blessed with at birth and which things can be taught. And of course, teaching doesn't just mean in school, but also within the family and within the subculture of our greater national cultures. It is incredibly and critically important to, have, to seek, find, and have mentors, sponsors, advocates, and allies, people who will support you, who will point out advan uh, things you should do, those who will uh, uh, make it possible for you to do those things, who will really sponsor your uh, growth. And, find, and also networks are an incredibly important thing. Re, uh, peer networks, those from the same group, uh, mentors who can teach you what they know, uh, the, the women uh, groups of peers uh, who get together, uh, the importance of ability to create peers. We've learned today that you need not be the head of an institution in order to begin to introduce change into that institution. Um, but deliberate change is needed if we really want to uh, make that inflection point so that the uh, composition of our institutions reflects the composition of our country. Um, and we have to protect ourselves. We cannot let our leaders burn out. We as leaders must have people to fall back on, uh, partners, families, friends, uh, all of those things are very much important to have uh, uh, in our lives. Organizations that formally do uh, work advocating for uh, individuals from different groups like SACNAS, Abracams, there's any number of, of uh, groups and often within professional societies, there are subgroups that should be sought out uh, and encouraged and supported by those institutions and societies. Organizations like the Cal State system are uh, very important in terms of showing uh, and propagating shared, uh, shared governance, a culture that, that supports underrepresented students and staff, um, and that 
provides mentoring and apprenticeships such that uh, uh, Dr. Sumana uh, described. And then leveraging the power of, of the university system to affect change. This could happen nationwide. Uh, we need to find means of communication so that we learn about those successful things and we figure out how to scale them in different institutions. One of the things that we know is that every college university uh, are, is different um, and that different uh, organizations have different internal cultures and within those cultures, they need to be uh, looked at and see how these programs can be fit into those structures in an organic way. And finally, a lot of the racism, sexism, et cetera, that occurs comes about because of learned behavior within our organizations. We, uh, we, we have to unlearn or relearn our history. I would say we need a more accurate representation of our history. Uh, we need to start telling, we need to tell our truths so that the society as a whole can see those truths. And I would point out that is because of these uh, widespread inaccuracies in our understanding of what our national history is that we have built into our culture systemic problems that lead to in, in uh, continuation of under uh, less opportunity for certain groups within the country. And of course, science communication or communication of science is not limited to scientists, although we need to get a whole lot better at it. And we can best learn that from our colleagues in the social sciences and in the arts and humanities. And we need to be more talkative to each other. So scientists need to learn from people in the humanities to tell our stories because facts alone, we have learned certainly in the last five years, facts do not uh, on their own convince people who have already determined something that is not true to be true. It's stories that do that. It's listening to the, why they feel that belief. It's countering with why they might consider other kinds of belief. And finally, uh, not finally, I keep saying finally, but that's because I am coming close to the end of this, is that we need to leverage existing uh, uh, DEI efforts and companies. Uh, we need to be prepared uh, for the company to leverage what you do within that company to make itself look good. That's okay. Institutions are more than the sum of the people within them. And sometimes your interest and the interest of the organization will not coincide. And so you need to know that and you need to be prepared to deal with it within the institution and within your own work. And as Yo-Yo Ma said, culture turns the other into us. So when we share our stories, when we truly listen to each other's stories, that is when we begin to realize that it's not us and them, it's us as a, whole, as a very interesting, complex and diverse whole. And so Suzanne ends by saying, so perhaps all of us scouts who've been out there on the edges uh, need to become leaders who rebel with a cause as uh, Sharon McCrane stated, to come together to form networks that change organizations. And so I'm going to uh, stop with that lovely summary, which I somewhat mangled from Suzanne. And now we will go to some questions. And so I'm gonna go catch up with those questions here uh, as soon as I can find my question and answer box. Here we are. Okay. And I think we are enough people still that I think probably we won't highlight. And uh, Jane, please give me the high sign as we approach our adjournment time. So one of the questions okay. that, thank you. One of the things that we have, uh, one of the questions we got from Keith Trujillo was meant for the last three panelists, but also really applies to any of the other panelists who are still with us, which is that right now we're living and working in a political environment where there is are many who are cynically working against DEI 
and attempting to hide historical facts essential to the understanding of the current situation. And of course, moderators, I think you should consider yourself part of these uh, groups as well. That, I mean, people who can answer questions. Um, so these, they're in attempting to hide historical facts essential to understanding the current situation. So what would your advice be on how to move forward in the current climate? And um, now I can't see all of you, so please just speak up. Panelists. Otherwise, I'll be forced to answer myself, and I suspect that you will have better answers. Well, I'll take a crack. Oh, there we go, Cynthia. Well, I wasn't sure if I should type it in or, or whatever. And that's oh. another, just a great question as all the questions have been when you look through the, about the Q&A section and the chat box and that. But for me, it, it comes back to, again, know what it is you're talking about and having good data, good information, good research and keep presenting it and then presenting it in different formats and in then different vehicles, whether it's using social media, whether it's publishing an article or an editorial in the opinion page of your local newspapers and that, but reinforcing what you know and believe to be the truth, you know, pushing out those facts, you know, and, and I'm here in North Dakota, there's a, there's a group going on relative to um, the issue of literacy journalism literacy and, and how does that play out particularly in the last 18 months two years and everything that happened on the political side and that and who is telling the truth and whose truth is it but how do you assure and and my point in being part of that group was that my understanding of journalism as a profession is that it is about truth telling there's credentials like like being a licensed physician or nurse or scientist. There, there's protocols relative to peer review in that. And so believing in that knowledge that we know is truthful, good, factual knowledge, and then and then sharing that in the different vehicles that are good for us. For me, that becomes storytelling. But integrating the data. <laughs> You know, little tidbits of data in that and, and telling people, talking to people on their level and in their way and in their language. Thank you. And I would add that one on one helps. I have a very big family as well. I don't have uh, 14 siblings. I only have five. Uh, but I do have 17 nieces and nephews, over 100 first cousins and 31 going on 32 grand nieces and nephews. And we are a uh, extraordinarily uh, wide range of opinions and political viewpoints in the family. And we all still, for the most part, talk to each other. And one of the things that helps is, of course, shared history, uh, because we're a family. The other thing that helps, I, I think, is the ability to listen to each other with respect. Um, uh, some of my uh, dearly beloved are uh, quite different in their convictions than I am, uh, but, but they ask me questions about things, and I try to understand where they are coming from and answer the question in a way which is neither condescending nor assumes anything, but really to explain why those facts are I assume they're facts, uh, why I trust those uh, recommendations. Uh, sometimes I e I've never used the term clinical trial, but I do describe while, how the testing of those things were done. And, and that seems to help as well. Anyone else before I go on? Okay. Now, the other, another question comes from Rati Thanawala, who says, when your STEM students get to the STEM workplaces, they will need to show leadership in order to get lead roles as team leaders, et cetera. What specific leadership courses do STEM graduates take to develop their leadership skills? 
do they see the value of these skills in the STEM workplace as equally important for success as tech skills? So I'm gonna start with this and someone else can pitch in uh, simply by just start talking, <laughs> which is to say that um, what I tell students, I, I tend, this question tends to come up with students in particular when I go talk to undergraduates and graduate students, they wanna know how do they become uh, leaders? How do they make that first step? We heard some very good advice from uh, Jade earlier and in that he was very proactive. And so I will say, be proactive. And they will say, well, how do you be proactive? And I say, because they say we're, we don't feel comfortable asking these things. And I really do believe that all STEM students would uh, benefit from courses in acting, because that's what I did for much of the time was to say, okay, I'm gonna pretend like I belong here. I'm gonna pretend that I am not an introvert and I'm gonna just ask or seek out this person that I'm sort of afraid of. Um, and that really got, couldn't get you started. The remarkable thing that we know now from uh, studies in psychology and so forth is that if you do something and you pretend that you are something long enough uh, that you will find yourself more and more acting like that, or maybe it's just age. Would anyone else like to weigh in? All right then. So this was an anonymous attendee who has a question for me, which is, uh, it was nice to hear about my role in SACNAS. Wouldn't it be powerful to have an event in which SACNAS, ACES, SHIP, NESBY, Nobuche, uh, uh, SWE, that's the women engineers, and other organizations combined once every three or five years to hold a combined national conference? Well, that's a very interesting and uh, thoughtful idea, uh, that, that, which has come up over the years, I must say. There's a lot of cross membership in all of these uh, organizations. And so there's people who are members of all of them uh, or a good cross section of them. Um, I'll put it before the folks who are making these decisions now and we'll see what can happen. Uh, we could do it in, the, in terms of a kind of a, uh, oh, this is not anonymous, it's Nora Savage at NSF uh, who asked that question. Hi, um, uh, Lydia, this is Rati. I asked that question that you just answered about leadership training for students in undergrads and grad school for STEM. And you answered with the acting, which I think is a great idea. I strongly believe that especially for underrepresented minorities, uh, underrepresented groups, it's such a big transition to get to the workplace yes. and start moving up a trajectory, which is the same as or higher, a faster rate than what um, uh, they have been on and not take two years to find themselves <laughs> and move around in the organization to find some place where it's nicer for them. But to have twice the amount of leadership skills that you require on average to survive and thrive as an early career. So I believe that it's no one's responsibility right now, not the colleges and not the workplace that the underrepresented groups get that additional training well in time so that more of them can succeed. So I strongly believe that and I would love for someone to say, no, it's not necessary. You just learn your technical skills and do whatever other things, apprenticeships, and that's sufficient. Even though the playing field is gonna be so uneven for you, it's sufficient for you to do a good job. That is a quite wonderful comment, Rathi. And I think that this is being recorded, of course, so we'll have, uh, and there are people taking notes of various kinds. So we will be in touch with you as we write our reports because this sounds that it like a, it could be a recommendation uh, 
starting with the National Science Foundation and perhaps going elsewhere. Because so in terms of stories, let me just say, in terms of stories, as a manager, I was 39 years in tech and I retired as a vice president. And I can tell you, as first line, second line managers, we looked at the new people coming in and we at once within a few days sort of said, you know, watch this person. They're yeah. going to be, they have great potential. We yeah. had seen no output from that person. And we targeted people for assignments because we saw potential. And so this type of thing is so common even today that if our students haven't heard of these things because they've applied themselves more to the technical arenas only, then I think they are at a disadvantage. That's a good point. And there is one example that I could point to, which is the Keck Graduate Institute, which is one of the um, colleges, and I'm now blocking on the city in California, Claremont, one of the Claremont colleges. It's a graduate institution, which takes undergraduates who are both science and um, non-science, but all of whom are interested in positions in the business world, primarily in biotech and, te uh, and technology. One of the requirements for all students is that they must set up and complete an internship at a company. And the companies who take these students, uh, it's a serious uh, internship. They have to do, they often go on a team and they have to complete a project for the company and report on it and get graded on it by the company and by uh, the uh, professor in the institute. And this has started many of those students uh, on the path to being able to learn things. And KGI itself in its classroom teaching has, introduces students to these concepts fairly early. The degrees that they give range from masters to PhDs. And uh, we were told, I'm on that board, and we were told by the CEO of one of the companies, a big biotech in California, that they found that students from KGI advanced more rapidly through the company yes. than did Sloan students or Harvard MBA students because they had been introduced to these concepts so early. So, so Lydia, I talked to you offline. Yeah. yeah. I All don't right. want to take time here, but I will I will contact you because I have very uh, it's I think it's a very important thing given this seminar today was about leadership. And yes. uh, I would like to follow up with you on this. Terrific. I'll, I'll look forward to that. Do we have any other comments uh, from participants? Raise your hand or from the folks who are uh, on panelists or moderators, just speak up. Many could not stay today. I must say that in planning this, I, I uh, truly neglected to think about the holiday effect. And of course it is January 6th, as I said at the beginning. So there we are. Hi, this is Tox Fashola. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, um, I, this was great. I apologize I could not stay for the whole thing in the very beginning, but um, this has been very inspirational and fascinating. I want to thank M. Willie Pearson for inviting me to be a part of this, um, these, um, this series of panels. But I, I, wanted to, um, I wanted to speak to the comments of um, preparation of students. Yeah. Unless I'm mistaken, I, I what I heard was that the onus is on the students to, you know, to get, get the training, not on the universities and not on the um, business places. And, you know, if we're trying to broaden participation yeah, and if we're trying to if we're trying to broaden participation. Um, I would I would turn back and say the onus should be on the people who are trying to bring the students in. Right. Which include the organizations, which include the, the, um, the institutions. But I'm not just going to say the onus on that is on them. I'm going to step take a step further and say the NSF is already doing this. The NSF is already requiring this, unless I'm mistaken. They have the engineering research centers, and a part of that is workforce development. The part of workforce development is, you know, it's critical internships. They have to partner with a, a minority organization, with a um, minority institute for higher education, et cetera, et cetera. And part of it is they have to recruit, retain, and graduate and provide internship relationships and um, internship opportunities to underrepresented students. Secondly, the NSF has the LSMRCE, as we know, and has the bridge to the doctorate. So these are these are, you know, these are settings in which the NSF is 
able to do this anyway. Um, I know I'm the uh, evaluation PI for LSMRCE, um, and they have a great relationship with a couple of in, with Fermilab and also with um, oh gosh the second one um, skips my mind, but the students are required and expected to do exactly what my predecessor talked about, you know, in terms of commenting. So I would push back and say that not only is the onus on the NSF, but the NSF is already doing this anyway. Very good. And I would then add to that that NIH also has become aware of this and has been for a while. Uh, there are several universities, major R1 uh, research intense universities, who were told by NIH that their graduate uh, pr training programs were at risk because they did not uh, have any, it was not clear that they were serious about diversity amongst their faculty or their students. And um, one of the speakers who unfortunately could not, uh, had to cancel for today, uh, was going to talk about her work at Duke University and turning that uh, around into a situation where uh, the student graduate student body is much improved in terms of its uh, ability to attract and retain mm -hmm. students from diverse backgrounds that uh, she's been so successful that now she's been uh, asked to take that same on same problem on with faculty. And uh, at MIT many years ago, when I graduated from that school with my PhD, I was on their visiting committee for a decade and was my job was clearly to raise my hand and say, what are we doing about diversity? And my colleagues there, whom I admired very much, would say, we don't have to do anything. The best come to us, which missed the point. It took NIH telling them that they needed to get their act together uh, before they had uh, uh, instituted a program to bring uh, underrepresented students into the programs uh, uh, during the summer. And pretty soon the faculty were saying, why didn't I get one of those students this summer? And now they are doing better. They've got a long way to go yet in terms of uh, both students at the graduate level and uh, faculty. So there are efforts underway. And I think one of our challenges is to propagate these, as I said, and find out you know, what works and then let people know and put the onus on the organizations uh, to provide these training necessities, let's call them, to students um, as they proceed. Because you know, the whole point of a graduate education is to prepare students to be useful and to learn new things and to be leaders uh, as, as part of this. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, Lydia. It's 528. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone who has one last comment? And then we will adjourn. And I want to thank all of the speakers and moderators. Uh, it was quite wonderful. And I think, is that Suzanne's hand up? Uh, I'm, I'm back. Yeah, I'm so sorry I had to disconnect. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. I've been so disconnected. I don't know if you all have talked about this, but I think the, the other piece that um, I think we sometimes forget is you know, we, we tend to build the pipeline from the bottom up. And, and there's a lot of merit to that. Clearly, there's an end yeah. factor. But I think there's also merit in thinking about what happens to mid-career faculty and the degree to which we retain them and also put them in positions where they can aspire to leadership positions. I think very little attention has been paid to that piece. And I think it's a place where we need to intercede. And I think NSF um, should be poised to do that. Excellent point. Thank you. And on that good note, I want to thank those of you who have stayed with us to this end here. Uh, these will, the recordings for, I think, all speakers will be posted on the website and will be freely accessible. And we will make them publicly accessible. We will notify the world that they're available uh, some point after the last workshop is completed. It sometimes takes a little while to get them up, but um, they will be there. I greatly appreciate your participation. The questions were just wonderful. And I thank you and have a good evening and let's hope for the best in this new year. Hey, Lydia, one final yes. thought. Will there be a survey coming out? Oh yes, thank you very much, Jane. You will get a survey in about, uh, few minutes or a minute or less, please respond. We take those surveys extremely seriously, both in terms of how we conduct the next workshop, which is January 20th, 
and how we will prepare these reports that we are going to do both for NSF and for the general reading population. So please do respond to that uh, survey. We, we really would like to know your thoughts and see the answers to those questions. And now I wish you all a good evening and we'll see you, I hope, uh, on January 20th. Thank you very much. Thank you.